Thank you. Thank you. Check. All right. It's not like working. It's not working. Sorry about that. How are you guys doing? Great. Great. Awesome. Thanks for coming out. Uh, did you guys know the killer concert going on tonight? The killers are playing. What are you doing here? <laughs> Um, thanks for joining us. I think uh, it should be a really fun evening uh, talking to Brandon here. Thank you so much. So yeah, welcome. Uh, my name is Andrew Corey, and uh, there are a few things that I do here in Miami. One of the things uh, that I do is I created a company called Journey. It's an online platform where we connect freelance writers and journalists with brands that need content written for them. So on-demand content writing marketplace. Uh, everyone need, needs content, essentially, and so we're just basically trying to figure out how to make that very easy from an execution point of, uh, standpoint. Uh, another thing that I created was the Urban Ism Summit, which is kind of the next one. Uh, shameless plug. Uh, it's going to be happening here in Miami, and we're talking about how do we get all these uh, architects, urban planners, uh, people who are in policy, uh, those who are trying to solve the food and mobility, uh, aspect of things to really collaborate more. So uh, a lot of times we work in silos, right? And so it's, it's great to bring more collaboration to what we're doing so we can move things further, faster. So tonight I want to welcome Brandon. Uh, Brandon, welcome to yeah, Thanks, Thanks Collab. for actually showing up and not going to the Killers concert. <laughs> I know. They don't know what they're missing they over there. They didn't know it, it was happening? Yeah, <laughs> they probably didn't know it was happening. That's right. Sure. That's why you guys are here. So, so Brandon, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, where were you born? Where are you from? You know, what's, what's your deal? So, I'm actually one of the few people that's born and raised here in Miami. Um, I actually have my mother here in the audience. She comes. Yay, mom! How you yeah. doing? I'm gonna throw you under the bus. Uh, every time I do a speaking engagement, she happens to show up. So even if you guys didn't show up, she'd still be here. Um, she raised me here. I grew up in. Yeah. You went from mom. I grew up all over um, South Miami, Pinecrest, Coral Gables, um, Miami Beach, Key Biscayne. We just ended up all over the place. And my parents both have backgrounds in real estate. Um, my father was a developer. My mother was a, a is a broker. And we were just moving around from house to house. I ended up meeting a lot of very interesting people, from all these different backgrounds, and was able to explore different types of industries through meeting these very interesting people. Um, I explored the real estate industry uh, by proxy of my parents. It, it turns out I didn't like it. I didn't want to get into real estate. And uh, I ended up getting into technology. I taught myself how to program um, at Did 15. Did you went to FIU? I, yeah, after high school, uh, Gulliver, I went to FIU and then I went to UM. But I taught myself how to program. I'm probably the worst programmer in this whole room, if there are any other programmers. So yeah, we, we do have some programmers here. I think there's some folks from uh, WoodCode, uh, coding school. What, what program did you try to teach yourself that you sucked at? Um, just web, web, <laughs> web scripting, they would say. Um, it's not, it's not really coding. Okay. I, it's funny enough because I get so many people that ask me for tech advice because they think I'm this you know, smart tech guy, but I am, I don't know shit about coding. <laughs> I just know the basic concepts. I'm maybe an expert generalist. A little bit, you know a little bit about everything. Well, you can always hire someone from WinCode or Iron Hack, or you can go on uh, Upwork and find a freelancer. Um, well, so you started a company some years ago called Gas Ninja. Tell us a little bit about how that came about and where you're at right now. Yeah, so Gas Ninja is, Barrett and I, Barrett, my partner, who's not here, he's vacationing in Tulum, now that we've been acquired. Um, life. Yeah, so we, we came up with the idea um, on his balcony. We were just looking out at all the cars on the street, and we were thinking, oh, what's, what's big right now? Um, on demand is, is huge. Maybe we could do something with on demand. And we saw all these cars, and we thought, what do they all need? They all need gas. So we came up with this silly idea to deliver gas to people's cars. Um, our assumptions in the beginning were very wrong. We thought we could deliver gas to people's cars parked in parking garages. And even before we, fought, even before we bought our first gas truck, we ended up getting a cease and desist, which is interesting. I'll come back to that later. Um, but the idea really just came from this idea of hating the gas station. My mother would tell me how much she hated going to the gas station. Actually, I would, 
I would have to pump gas for my mother every time she needed gas. She would never pump her own gas. So out of necessity of having to stop pumping my mother's gas, even not living with her, I guess I started this company. Wow. Your mom was basically, I mean, her pump, not pumping gas was the problem you're trying to solve as an entrepreneur. I, I didn't want to see my mom anymore. I was only going to hang out with her to pump her gas. And you figured you could scale that I to millions of moms. More moms. More <laughs> That's great. So where is the company now? Um, what, what, what's happening right now with gas stations? Yeah, so um, we ended up getting acquired back in August. Chris Deschino, our attorney, actually handled the acquisition. He's over there. And uh, we had, I'd say, 90 days of handcuffs. So in the end of November, we didn't have anything else to do except watch it continue to grow. So we were acquired by a company over in Silicon Valley called Exajoule. They are an energy holding company that was founded actually by my competitor over on the West Coast. So he had a startup called Filled. They raised a lot of money doing on-demand fuel delivery. And he had some issues with his team and his board and he, crazy enough, somehow ended up coming into a lot of money and he decided to leave his company and start his own on-demand fuel delivery company. And instead of starting from scratch, he figured he could buy us. And it was only because I had a good rapport with him that we were able to make this deal happen. Uh, we kept in touch over the last year talking about regulation. It's interesting because you don't want to talk to your competitors. Your first idea is I don't want to talk to my competitors to share my secrets. Um, but really, it's, it's interesting to keep in touch with your competitors uh, from afar. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer, of course, they say. Um, but by keeping in touch with my competitor, we were able to turn an interesting situation, uh, which we thought was going to be the demise of our business, um, into a successful exit. Now, um, a lot of people get into startup land, uh, entrepreneurship, with a lot of assumptions. Uh, some think it's a very glamorous life from the outside, especially when they, you, know, you think about uh, whether it's Facebook or Snapchat, and people talk about these massive scales. They hear words like unicorn, uh, you know, massive amounts of exits, you know, you make a lot of money, and all of a sudden, people buy private planes and vacation in Tulum. Yeah. Um, but what were some of the assumptions that were immediately debunked once you started your journey? So, like I said earlier, delivering gas to people's cars in their garages, that's illegal. You can't, can't do that because you have this gas tank that's flammable, it could explode, and the fire marshals don't like that. So you can't deliver gas to people's cars that are in parking garages. We thought that'd be cool because we could just sign up all these condos as, a, as an amenity to the condo association. Uh, for these uh, high-end apartments and then just have all this great density. You send a fuel truck into each garage and you have one, two, three, four, five, six, 10, 12, 15, 30 cars that you can fill up all at once. So we literally planned our business around this idea. And thankfully, we were able to... And this was you not doing any research? Yeah, we, we didn't do that much research. We did a little bit of research before we bought our first we're gas truck. We doing the whole assume thing, which is yeah. what they typically say, it makes an ass out of... So you would be, right? You've heard that sort of before. <laughs> Assume, go ahead. We made an assumption, and then before we bought our first truck, we wanted to see if the market wanted it. Um, and this is a, a lean methodology that you read about in um, The Lean Startup by Eric Reitz. You have to build your minimum viable product, but even before that, you should try and test your assumptions before you even spend any money. So we thought, okay, maybe we could deliver gas to these condos. Let's see if they're actually interested. So we made this little pitch deck 10 slides about this uh, idea that we had. We said, hey, condo, we have this business that we're launching in January, January 2015, 16, January 2016, and uh, we'd like to know if you would want to be one of our launch partners. And we got in touch with all the condo managers of these associations, and they thought, wow, this is really cool. They got back to us with some interest, but before we bought our first gas truck, we were getting ready to get everything started and start investing money. We got the cease and desist from the fire marshals and it turns out, hey, they didn't like that. They thought what we were doing was illegal and we actually, we had to go meet with them and before we met with them, we had to do a lot of research, figure out what the code is, is our idea gonna be dead from the start? So I spent you know, endless nights just pouring through fire safety code. Uh, that was not a lot of fun, but I ended up addressing all of the points that the fire marshal brought up in the cease and desist, and I was able to essentially prove that what we were doing was legal. So he said, okay, fine, you can deliver gas, just 
not in garages. Do it on the street, do it at people's businesses, just not in parking garages. So we thought, okay, well, you know, we could still make money by delivering gas to people's cars on the street or at their home, so why don't we, why don't we try that? And we moved forward. We actually tested a few different business models. One was delivering gas to people's cars at their home. Another was delivering gas to people's cars at work. Uh, we got some Fortune 500 customers where we would offer fuel delivery as a, as a perk, employee perk. And we had a lot of, we had three, I would say three decent competitors that were all doing something a little bit different. And just because you see competition doing one thing and just because they raised five million bucks or 10 million bucks for a certain business model, you can't look at them and say, oh, that's, that's the solution, that's what we need to do. We wanted to test everything to make sure what they were doing was actually a valid business model. So we tested what our competitor Booster Fuels was doing, what Phil was doing, and we found that we were making the most profit by cutting out daytime delivery completely, even though our customers wanted that. We assumed that, hey, people want to get gas during the day, people want to get gas at work, but it was too expensive. It's really fucking expensive to drive around during the day, sit in traffic. You know, you got this guy that's you know getting paid hourly driving this fuel truck, and it's not cheap to hire fuel truck drivers. So that assumption was uh, debunked. We ended up finding out that it was more profitable to deliver gas at night. We told our customers, hey, no more fuel delivery during the day. You can only get gas at night between the hours of 10 and 7 in the morning. It's overnight. You wake up to a full tank of gas. And a lot of people didn't like it. And we said, hey, why don't you try it? It's free. Free delivery overnight. And so how many times, times did you pivot? We pivoted probably six times. So once we did this whole nighttime delivery model, we happened upon this enterprise fueling model. So I mean, a lot of times uh, startups think uh, make this error that you have to stick with the exact same idea that you started out with, or at the same set of parameters that you started out with. But you know, it's very common for startups to pivot. That's part of the game. You're constantly adjusting because all these assumptions as you're going along. Um, especially if you've never done this before, which is typically what startups do, uh, you are always going to run into these roadblocks. So as we're doing this, I mean, did you have, I mean, you have a co-founder, correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did he have any experience at all in startup, doing startups, or? or we, we both had previous Who helped to guide you money in, in this journey? Actually, it was, it was, it was just us. <laughs> it was just us. Um, we, we had some mentors. Um, which were essentially angel investors that we had spoken with. We didn't. We ended up taking no money. Uh, we decided to self fund and stay bootstrapped. But yeah, you, you end up pivoting, or you should pivot. Sometimes you start an idea and you think, hey, I don't want to. I don't want to change what I'm doing. Even though it's not working out, I don't want to change what I'm doing. I want to keep trying to make it work because I told all my friends that I'm going to do this business and this is how I'm going to do it, and I don't want to look like a failure. But really, if something's not working you're just shooting yourself in the foot by continuing to do something that's not working. And it's better off for you to you know, maybe explore a new direction. You learn more actually on your first day of actually selling your product than you do all the time that you spend leading up to that day that you actually launch your product. So we had all these assumptions, all these assumptions about our customer. And it reminds me of actually my uncle um, through marriage, my aunt's ex-husband, uh, two ex-husbands ago. He, he invested a million dollars in some crazy idea to start a dating website where everybody would be verified, background checked, and he spent a million dollars and two years of his time building this perfect product because he wanted it to be absolutely perfect before he got it in front of his first customer. And it wasn't until he actually got it in front of his first customer that it turns out people didn't care. And he wasted a million dollars and two years of his life to get there. So it's important, I think, to test your assumptions. Sure. Early. And then Tinder came along. Tinder came along, yeah. It changed dating forever, if you can call it that. But uh, so, growing up in Miami, uh, and you see Miami from many different locations, and so you've been in different environments. Uh, what is the tech scene or start scene in Miami? Um, how do you see it from your perspective right now? And when you were when you started out. Did you have the support you needed from tech or startup scene um, versus, say, now you feel more confident going into something else and having that support? You, you think we have an ecosystem right now? So we're still, we, we have a very young ecosystem here in Miami. And we're almost at a disadvantage because when we had this idea, when we had a decent business model and some decent prospects for 
business to business fueling, we decided, hey, maybe we can go raise some money. Let's talk to some investors. So we, we talked to some local investors and uh, small VCs, and they said, oh, you know, it's kind of kind of early. We want to see this. We want to see that. And we started reaching out to other investors in other places, uh, New York, uh, the Midwest, Silicon Valley. And it's funny because if you're not from Silicon Valley and you're talking to investors from Silicon Valley, people look at you like you're, an like alien. you're nothing, like you're an alien, like you're not a real startup unless you started in Silicon Valley. And you're almost at a disadvantage. But we are building a real tech community here. And uh, funny enough, my mother always says that Miami is like this hub that connects Latin America to the rest of the world. And we have a lot of startups that are coming here and and starting really interesting businesses that are creating efficiencies and solving real problems in Latin America. And Miami is this hub that, that connects them to the rest of the world. So you do have more money here that I've seen for investment. You do have more support from Endeavor, Knight Foundation, and so on. So now more than ever, you have more assistance and more reason to get out there and actually launch that idea that, that you have if you haven't actually gone ahead and done so. You know, so uh, speaking to launch ideas in you know, Miami being sort of, I like to call the capital of Latin America, um, a lot of times we look at startups from the perspective of scale and how big we can get and how fast we can get there. So we take a play from the playbook of, say, White Combinator, you know, Sam, Sam Alden and these guys who uh, essentially kind of wrote the book on the accelerated model and we forget that the majority of uh, our economy is pretty much run by small businesses. And while everyone is thinking on very large scale and becoming a unicorn who's going to hit that billion dollar mark now, we're talking about trillion dollar companies. Um, and who's going to be some of the, among the first to get there? I mean, your company, you know, Gas Ninja, and say many other companies globally, I mean, how, how do you get out of that mode of, I have to become a billion dollar company? Um, I have to do something that actually scale. So you and just and just make money and make a living and contribute to the economy and give back. It's funny because you'll get a lot of advice that says focus on profits later, <laughs> which I think is is not necessarily great advice because it's easy to build a company and say, hey, I'm going to get this product out for free so that I can get a lot of signups and. And, and a user base and get over the snowball effect that I, need a, that I need to beat. But I think it's more important to build a company that's profitable, a company that you know makes economic sense after you know, you've given away a little bit too much in the beginning. Are people willing to pay for your service? So we were offering free fuel delivery for uh, the first six months. And it's easy to say yes to free. It's, it's also easy to say yes to gas that's cheaper than your local gas station. But when you need to actually make money to, to pay the bills, to pay your employees, and you're giving everything away for, for free, how is that business sustainable? Are you going to rely on, on outside funding to continue to grow your business? What if you don't get that outside funding, all that time that you've spent building this business, what, what happens? Do you end up failing? So I think as soon as you can, it's important to, to get to profitability. Um, more so than to think about, okay, well if I give away my product for free, then I, I can acquire 100,000 users, or a million users, or 10 million users, and then be worth a billion dollars. But how are you gonna get to a billion dollars if you can't pay the bills if it takes you five years to get there? So you lose, you lose track sometimes, and I think it's important to make sure you're profitable so that you can actually make it to your, you know, $10,000 valuation, $100,000 valuation, million, $10 million, billion dollar valuation. If you're not profitable, what are you worth? You know, recently, um, Paul Singh uh, was going around in an airstream. He's an investor, uh, and he did a tour here uh, recently. And one of the things that he told me was basically, listen, your first million dollars is pretty much, you gotta go gangbusters. It's all about your sales. It's about you uh, just busting through to make it happen by almost any means necessary. And I think sometimes we, as entrepreneurs and people who are you know, starting companies, we, we come from a, uh, some, we get some very bad advice I think in the very beginning, where we're told that, get an idea and they go for funding. Well, in, in reality, as you just said, 
instead of I have an idea and then go look for funding, it's go make it profitable. So having the correct people around you, giving you the right advice is super important. So where did you guys go for mentorship? So our mentorship came from the best from the investors that said, no, we don't want to give you money. Basically, they would tell us X, Y, and Z reasons why sorry, we should. Just, just came out. <laughs> well, sorry, guys. Uh, we're actually doing an event. Before what? Gracias. Thank you. Anyways, we, we got our mentorship, if any, from the investors that said, no, we don't want to invest in your company, either because you're too early, you're trying to raise too much money when you don't have enough profitability, uh, you don't have enough revenues, you don't have this, you don't fit in my box. So we, we asked, okay, well, what do you need? And we kind of compiled all this advice that we got from all of these people that said no, and that was, that was kind of like our mentorship. Um, so you can but, actually go to someone who could just give advice. You're literally getting rejected and then taking advice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that was your right. You, you learn from your mistakes, if anything, um, but also you learn more not from the mistakes that you make, but from the mistakes that other people make. So that's, that's a catch-22 there because you go out, you look for advice from all these people on the internet, even me, myself, that are all trying to give advice, and who am I? Okay, maybe I, I, I built one company and I sold it, but my advice doesn't necessarily apply directly to you, or someone else's advice doesn't necessarily apply, uh, apply directly to you. Everybody's business is different. You gotta, you gotta know who to ask, because it's not just asking generally. Yeah, you could ask someone that's maybe more related to what you're doing, or is doing something more related to what you're doing, and every model's different. Maybe you have a, a product that is free, and you have no profitability, you're just relying on on getting users and eyeballs and, and, and scale eventually. Um, but I think it's very important to make sure that you have a business model that is viable, that will turn a penny, and something that people will actually pay for. It's very easy to give away something for free, but as soon as you ask for a dollar, then that's, that's your proof of concept. That's what investors want to see. They want to see that there's revenue being generated. You know, so uh, lately we've been talking when I say we, it's like I put myself in this category of these I'm, I'm millions of people, uh, of experts. Uh, but there's been a lot of chatter around you know, mental health and well-being, and especially among entrepreneurs, because we're always so on. You know, we're ultra into solving our problems. And that, that, that thing that we're pursuing, and we get you know, pulled from the investor side, you know, what am I going to do to meet investor demands, user demands, improve my product, uh, how am I going to scale this? When is the next version? Oh my gosh, there's a bug that we just launched this and we spend X amount of dollars and it's not working. Um, but, you know, the, what, what, is, what, is, what was it like going through this? I mean, did you have relationships? I mean, did you have a girlfriend here this time? Who did you go to for those like very private moments where, you know, shit hits the fan and you just have your breakdown? Uh, or did you even have any of those? Uh, I mean, what was that like for you uh, in your journey? So I was, was not. Your goal to person? I was not in a relationship, so I did not go to a girlfriend to cry on when everything was uh, going really poorly. Um, but I did have my my co-founder, and it's it's very important, I think. Did to you have forego a relationship intentionally, just so you can focus on your startup? Actually, I did. I did. Um, I would get. I would be too involved in a relationship and I wouldn't have enough time to hustle and I think hustle is very important when you have a startup. And we would work, you know, nine to five and then five to nine, 10, 11, 12, and we would just work until we had to sleep sometimes. And when you have a relationship, sometimes that can slow you down, but it is important. It is important to have people that you could talk to when times are tough or if you're at a crossroads. And I think it's important to have a co-founder that you can bounce ideas off of. As a solo founder, it's, it's, it, it could be tough because you don't have someone else to bounce ideas off of. And you can be too caught up in your product or in your business to um, see another perspective. So it's, I, I think, important to have a co-founder or have a, a partner or some advisors that, that can give you outside advice because sometimes you just get too wrapped up in your own Kool-Aid. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, you can be too much in your own head. Uh, now, are there any conferences, as far as professional development is concerned, did you, were there any things that you did to kind of, you know, keep abreast of what's going on in your industry as well as just the general startup industry? 
uh, or their particular blogs that you're reading, books you're reading. I know mean, you were talking about the, <clears throat> the Lean Startup, for instance. Uh, but what were some of your resources? Yeah, Lean Startup, I think, is a very important book for any entrepreneur to read before they start a business. Um, there's a lot of really, really, really great blogs out there with a lot of great content. I learned more about business from the internet than I did in business school. And I studied, I studied marketing at, at UM. And I dropped out because I realized I was learning more in the real world than I was in school. I'm not encouraging you to drop out if you're still in school. Drop out but of school. <laughs> I'm saying that there, there's a lot of great content on the internet to learn <laughs> Uh, about entrepreneurship, but also to learn about whatever industry you're in. I had to learn all about gasoline. I, I had never sold gas before. I never had a gas company before I started a gas company. And before having a startup, my first startup was when I was at 15. Um, I created a website that was selling followers on social media. And I taught myself how to program. I taught myself marketing. Um, as I went from business to business to eventually get to Gas Ninjas, I didn't know anything about anything. I, everything was self-taught, from sales to, uh, to, to be able to land our, our huge enterprise contract that gave us the valuation that got us acquired. I had to learn sales. And it was from the internet, but also from a very close friend of mine who's also here, Sebastian. Sebastian, um, in a way. Your photographer. And, and my photographer, <laughs> thanks. So he has been a mentor in a way because he worked at an interesting startup in New York called Percolate. And he learned this incredible sales process that Percolate spent a lot of money on. They raised you know, tens of millions of dollars and hired one of the best uh, consultancy firms to come in and give them a great sales process. And he learned the sales process by working at Percolate and he was able to share this awesome sales process and the importance of follow-ups and cold emails and finding the decision makers to eventually get me to the enterprise contacts that got us the big deals that gave us our valuation. Everything was, was self-taught. And it's all about getting out there, getting on the internet, doing your research. You know, if you have your nine to five job, or you're going to school, or you have your startup, you're working during the day, but then at night, fuck Netflix, fuck that. Get on the internet, learn. No have, Netflix and chill. No Netflix and chill, you, you, sh you should be hustling. If you have a startup, you should be hustling, you should be learning all the time. You should always be reading, always be learning. Yeah, they say basically if you're not working on your startup, if you're in that mode, everything else is just a distraction. So, you know, obviously, people talk about life balance. Um, is there such a thing? <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's life balance, but also it, it, it takes discipline um, as well. If, if you're leaving uh, a nine to five, if you're starting your own business, especially if you don't have an office. For example, we almost ended up working here at the lab. And when you have office space, you're going there for a certain number of hours and while you're in your office, you should be working. Barrett and I, my co-founder and I, live in the same building, separated by one elevator. I live on one floor and he lives on a few floors down. <laughs> and we work from home, either from my living room or his living room. And a work-life balance is really important, when, especially when you work from home, because you have so many excuses that can distract you and take you in Miami to the beach or take you to hang out with friends who are not doing anything. And uh, you, you need to be able to have a work-life balance and, and, and have uh, um, the discipline to work when you need to work. But also you can't overwork yourself and you can't get burnt out because then you get tired of what you're doing. There were a few times when we were so overworked with Gas Ninjas that when things were not going well and we worked seven months on a, on a deal with one of the largest telecom companies in the world and it falls apart, we thought, holy shit, we've been working so hard on this and it's not going anywhere, we should just quit. And we took a step back and for two or three days we decided, hey, let's, let's, let's unwind for a little bit. And that break helped us uh, refocus on what was important to get to the next Fortune 500 company that we wanted to land, to get to the next deal that would, that would, that would further the company. Finally, that got us to, to our deal with this big fleet management company. And um, you, have, you have this roller coaster of a ride when, when you have a startup, times are good, times are bad. And if you get burnt out and you're hit with the, the trough of a wave and, and things are not doing well, you might, you might freak out. You might have a nervous breakdown. You might quit. You know, so um, if you look back, what would you do differently? I mean, now that you've learned all these lessons, how would you go about it? Uh, do you make a lot of assumptions? Are you going to do more research now before you jump into the next thing? Is there a next thing? So. 
we spent a lot of time when we were too young thinking we could raise a lot of money. We thought, hey, we were in on-demand. The on-demand space was hot, and we thought, hey, we oh, You were going on the buzzword side of things. Yes. Like, say, buzzwords. right now, create a deck and tell it to show that it's uh, blockchain, there's AI and yeah, machine right. learning, deep learning, and you're going to get $10, $10 million right that for an idea. Yeah, so we, we had competitors, and we saw our competitors doing things like raising $3 million bucks, $9 million bucks, $12 million bucks, and we had raised zero million bucks, and we thought we could, we could get some of that money. It, it's out there, you hear about all these companies getting funding all over the place, I could get money too. And when we were too young, we barely had any revenue, we spent probably six months going around trying to find money. And that was six months that you're not spending growing your business. And the six months that we spent trying to find money, we got six months of answers that said you're too young to get money. Now maybe if you're in Silicon Valley, things are different, it's a lot easier to get capital over there, here, Investors are concerned about, you know, what, what's their collateral? What are they investing in? How are they going to get their money back? And if you don't have any product that's turning a profit, then I'm not going to give you any money. I think it's the same there. I mean, investors invest to get their money back, no matter what um, ecosystem you're in. But I think here in Miami, it's a different market because most investors, even though it's kind of an oxymoron, they're risk averse, right? Because they don't understand yeah. a lot of the startup space, especially tech. Uh, what your mom does, real estate is what they understand very much. Um, you know, they know how to bring their money and drop it in the build and, and brickle and, and let it sit there for years. Uh, so, yeah, what you're saying, you know, not being able to raise money because you're young and based upon your ecosystem that you're in, you have to be very creative. Uh, and it's never always usually you go for the money first after having an idea. It's about what? Sales, right? It's about traction. Yeah, spending that time. Yeah, I think, I think you need traction in order, in order to raise money, you need traction. Unlike a lot of these blockchain companies now, which are raising a lot of money with ICOs and, and no product. But uh, when you have a, a real startup and you're trying to raise some money, if you don't have any traction, or if you have limited traction, people, people aren't gonna give you the light of day. But, but let's just say there, uh, it's like you know, going back to the guys who are doing the ICOs right now, the initial coin offerings. Uh, it's, do you think this is a little bit smart on their side? They're, they're kind of being tactical about what's this whole fundraising because maybe they're trying the traditional route, they can get the money. And they're taking advantage right now of the euphoria, the buzz. And yeah, it might not be full on ethical, but hey, sure. people are putting money in. I think. I mean, you kind of have to be smart too, right? Yeah, they're, they're trying to take what they can get, but when these companies are raising so much money without having a working product or without having even tested any assumptions really, I think they're shooting themselves in the foot because they have all this money and they think, hey, I can throw money at an idea and it should work. And it doesn't always work like that. I, I think there's no amount of polish that can hide a shitty idea. And there's no, there's no, um, if, you have a, if you have a good idea, it doesn't take any polish to shine. Sorry. So if you have all this money and you just throw money at this idea, you know, maybe you end up wasting it and finding out later that this idea didn't really matter. People don't really want to pay for it. Um, like I said, giving away stuff for free is easy and people will, will take your product. That, that doesn't really show you any traction by giving away your product for free. But we bootstrapped. Gas Ninjas, we, we barely spent any money. We would drive around with, you know, cheap flyers that we put on everybody's cars, um, giving away, funny enough, free gas, like $3 in free gas. We, it's a funny story, we, we drive around in Wynwood all the time and, and um, I'd be in the driver's seat and my partner Barrett would be in the passenger seat and we had this method down where we drive by each car going about five miles an hour and he'd, he'd fly every single car. And um, we, were, <laughs> we woke up in the morning to go hit some more cars with flyers because we'd, we'd do a few hundred a day. This was our spare time, we'd, we'd send out flyers or we'd you know, put flyers in people's cars. We woke up in the morning to a bunch of angry emails, and it turns out that Barrett, um, I had gone to dinner um, with some friends, and while I was at dinner, Barrett was bored. So Barrett went and hit a parking lot on Miami Beach and put about 100 flyers on some random cars in Miami Beach. And it turns out there was some rain overnight, and it was midsummer Miami, so in the morning, when the sun was shining on these wet flyers, the flyers had fused to the windows of the cars. 
and people were trying to take these flyers off and it was just leaving the residue and we had so many, we had probably 50 angry emails of people that were fucking pissed about these flyers stuck on their car. Oh, you're obstructing my window, I'm gonna sue you, this is horrible. So Barrett and I freaked out, oh, what do we do? It's just shit. And um, we said, all right, um, we're gonna offer you guys uh, a free car wash. Uh, we're so sorry about this, we wanna make it up to you and we wanna offer you some free gas. And those 100 people that got flyers stuck to their car, um, we had some guy go and you know wash all the cars with like a, um, a spray car wash. And we offered free car washes to all the people and some free gas to use the service. And those 100 people were so happy with what we did that they told all their friends about Gas Ninjas how fucked up this was and they made it right. And we got a bunch of customers. Um, I don't remember what the question was, but I thought it was, I thought it was a funny story. <laughs> Good story. Uh, you guys, so, sorry, I, I, so you gotta stay lean, and we could have easily just spent a lot of money. We could have raised a lot of money and just given away a lot of free gas to get customers to sign up. Um, or just pay them in bitcoins. Or just pay them in bitcoins, <laughs> sure. Yeah. But by not raising a lot of money, and by staying lean, we were able to figure out what ideas worked and what ideas didn't work. So we found out that this wasn't that profitable, that wasn't that profitable, that wasn't that profitable. And it wasn't until we ended up on this enterprise fueling model um, that we realized that this would be the best bang for our buck. And yeah, so you go from the consumer to a B2B model, and that's what, where you saw most success. And the only reason we ended up on that model is because we took the time to call customers. And I think this is really important when you, have a, when you have a startup. Because when you have a business, you need to get customer feedback to figure out what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. And also, maybe your customer has an idea about your business that could make your business better. And we did get an idea. So we called up one of our customers, and it was this guy in, in Miami Beach who um, got really pissed off at his daughter because he thought his daughter had stolen the car. And uh, he told us the story when I, when I called him and I asked him um, what he thought about the service. He said, yeah, I thought my daughter stole my car because I woke up in the morning to a full tank of gas. And I knew I was out of gas, so there was only one way that I had a full tank of gas. My daughter stole the car and, and filled it up on her way home because she obviously needed gas. So it turns out that the, the daughter just used gas ninjas and wanted to surprise the father with a full tank of gas. And he thought that was so cool. And while he had us on the phone, while he had me on the phone, he, he said, hey, you know, I have this business uh, with a small fleet of 20 vehicles, would you be able to fill our vehicles? And I said, yeah, sure, we do fleet fueling. We, we did like uh, car, uh, car rental agent agencies and stuff. And he said, yeah, but the only problem is my fleet is distributed. My employees take their cars home every night. And I said, yeah, well, we, we could do that. That's what we already do. We fill up people's cars at home at night while they sleep, so they wake up with a full tank. And he said, oh, that's great. So um, we set up an account with him, and it turns out that it saved him a lot of money and a lot of time because his employees would go to the gas station and waste 20, 30 minutes. So they'd go inside, they'd get snacks, they'd use the restroom, talk on the phone, just waste time. And uh, so we saved him uh, productivity. We saved him money on the gas bill. And we thought, hey, maybe there's some bigger companies that would like this service. And it turns out the biggest, the biggest fleets in the world do this. They all take their, their cars home every night. They let the employee home garage, not like UPS. UPS takes all of their trucks and parks them in a facility. The USPS, FedEx. Um, these guys all, all park in a big facility. And we thought fleet fueling is just driving up and down the aisle and hitting all the cars in the middle of the night. But really, fleet fueling was going to be something different. And it was filling up people's cars, um, pe filling, filling up technicians' cars at home overnight. So that was our big breakthrough. And um, we found out that a company like Kone Elevator wastes about $12 million a year in productivity just stopping at the gas station. So by filling up that elevator technician's car overnight while he sleeps, um, they eliminate all that time wasted at the gas station. And that guy that's supposed to be on the clock fixing elevators has more time to fix elevators. So they become more profitable. The bigger, bigger fleets like AT&T, they have 50,000 vehicles across America. They waste about $300 million a year stopping at the gas station. Just that time that the guy detours from your house to the next customer's house, that guy's wasting about 20 to 30 minutes. And we, we found out this information through you know, telematics data and such. And that's how we ended up upon this business model that would help gas ninjas grow a lot faster. If you have a customer like AT&T that has a few hundred cars in the Miami market, 
and you fill up their cars and you create efficiencies. When you want to expand to another market, let's say Philadelphia, where they have 4,000 vehicles, you're profitable from the first day. As soon as you put vehicles in a new market, your big enterprise customer already has vehicles that need gas. So we realized, shit, fuck condos, <laughs> fuck people's houses overnight, forget consumers, and we completely pivoted to this new direction. And if it wasn't for calling our customers, if it wasn't for staying lean, we would have wasted time and money and energy going in the wrong direction. And it wasn't until we happened upon this, this enterprise fueling model that we ended up finding what would give us value that would eventually get us apart. So look at that, you, you thought your why was helping your mom pump gas. <laughs> and then you ended up um, <laughs> enterprise level. So, you know, going forward, you've had an exit. Um, I don't know if you were happy with it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, but what's next? Are you going to continue in this line of becoming sort of a serial entrepreneur? Yeah, uh, I've been taking a little break. Um, it, it was right after the acquisition that Baird and I decided to leave and go to Bali for a month. Um, so we took a little break, did some traveling, and then since then I've, I've, I've done a little bit of traveling as well. But now it's time to get back to work. And I do have an interesting opportunity in the telemedicine space. So I will be going in that direction. Um, my partner in that, his, uh, his company is the largest healthcare company in Mexico by revenue. And he wanted to get into on-demand prescription delivery a while ago. Around the same time, I was getting into on-demand fuel delivery. and it didn't pan out for him. So now that I have some time on my hands and I'm not doing on-demand fuel delivery, we are working on potentially doing on-demand prescription delivery with some telemedicine, essentially FaceTiming with a, a doctor. And this is gonna be in, in Mexico. So that's the direction. So, yeah, you just give us a little tease. I don't wanna go too deep into that's that. That's it. <laughs> but uh, so but you're, you're continuing on the line of the whole on-demand delivery, it's logistics. Much as a service, it's what it's what I know. So I, I mean, I could start a completely new business in a new vertical, but you know, I could also leverage the experience that I've that I've gained in on-demand fuel delivery to um, to you know help people get healthcare in, in Mexico. Now, gas engine, just from a kind of sidetrack a little bit. Um, how far into the future, even if this business was to continue? You didn't have an exit, uh, you would continue to scale this. How far do you think we could scale, especially now that we're talking more about renewable energy, talking about electric, talking about the Teslas of the world, talking about sustainable planet, you know, sustainability on the planet. Uh, as, far, as far as that's concerned, I mean, how far do you think you could have gone, or, or how far would you want it to have gone, you know, from an ethics perspective, knowing that you're just kind of perpetuating a problem? Sure. Um, Actually, we did some research into renewable energy, uh, specifically with um, hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, the biggest problem with hydrogen fuel is that you can't find it anywhere. Hydrogen fuel, some scientists say, is the energy of the future. There's zero emissions, and you can get hydrogen f from thin air. You, you take the, the, the water molecules from air, and you, you split them, and you get hydrogen, and, and that's your, your source of energy. So. You can't go to a gas station and just fill up your hydrogen car with hydrogen gas because there are only 20 gas stations in all of America that have hydrogen fuel. And to upfit a current gas station to sell hydrogen gas, it costs anywhere from 500000 to $2 million. So how many gas stations do you need to upgrade across America for people to even care about buying a hydrogen car? The first company to sell hydrogen car here is, is Toyota and they're selling only in California, and like I said, there's only 20 gas stations in America that sell hydrogen fuel. They're all in California, and nobody's buying these hydrogen cars, even though this could be the energy of the future, um, because there's nowhere to get hydrogen fuel. So potentially we could deliver hydrogen fuel with a fuel truck, and it would be much cheaper to get a larger coverage area with one fuel truck that costs maybe 50 to 100,000, uh, versus having upgrade, let's say, you know, 25 gas stations in a certain city to get enough coverage area. So we considered that direction. Uh, it, it's interesting because people think, oh, electric is obviously the future, but in reality, uh, for example, the building that I live in, you have maybe 300 cars in the parking garage. Let's say 200 of them are Teslas, all drawing electric, um, electrical en energy from the grid. Um, our current grid infrastructure will not support the needs of the future if all of these cars are gonna be electric. 
Um, then you have things like uh, it costs five times more money to recycle a, a battery once you've, once you've made it. Um, we're going from a dependency on fossil fuels to now a dependency on um, minerals like nickel and lithium. So there's arguments in both directions, uh, whether we're going to go with electric or whether we're going to go with hydrogen. Um, but yeah, we could, we could deliver hydrogen fuel or we could potentially deliver electric energy, quick charges. So you're, is, you're, you're keeping your eyes um, and, and the roadmap open. Of course. At any yeah. time, you, you particularly would be um, ready to do so. So, uh, you know, we're wrapping up um, our little talk, but we definitely want to know if you have any questions for Brandon. Um, and so I want to open it up to you, all of you guys. Do you have any questions for Brandon? Just don't ask how much I sold the company for because I'm not allowed to tell you. <laughs> Mom, do you have a question for Brandon? Did, did, he, did he make his bet this morning that we would answer? I do have to tell you that he is very humble. His brand is brilliant. He's a genius. And when he was in high school, they gave him straight A's in computers because they couldn't teach him anything. So when they think he was self taught, so when they decided that they made him bring graphics. You're totally embarrassing him right now. That's what you know. See this, but that's the reason why he, he ended up writing shitty web script because they couldn't teach him. <laughs> um, well, thanks, mom, for being proud of your son naturally. He would be. Uh, anyone else have a question for Brendan? Yeah. First of all, congratulations. Thank you. Can you walk us through the business model that we have today? How you got to that business model? How are you getting the gas at least kind of from Shell? Oh, you want to you want to build the gas engine? If you did, then the, the company that acquired us is actually doing this really interesting distributorship model. They're kind of turning it into a franchise. Um, gas stations, you have 120,000 gas stations right now. 97% of them are franchises. The only reason we have this infrastructure to, you know, to gas up our cars is because of franchising. And there's no way that we could ever expand fuel delivery with there's no amount of venture capital that we could get to make fuel delivery big enough. It, ha it has to go in this direction of franchising or distributorship. But uh, we, we get the gas wholesale. And you have different economics with fuel delivery because you don't need the real estate. And you, could, you could deliver gas anywhere. So the average gas station has about 10 cents margin per gallon. And we'd see close to a dollar per gallon because we could deliver in a place like Miami Beach or Key Biscayne where gas is so much more expensive. And um, because of this mobile operation, you know, like I said, you don't you don't have the fixed you don't have the fixed costs of, of uh, the expensive real estate. So you know, moving forward, I kind of elaborated a little on the um, the enterprise fueling model. I think that's probably the best direction to go in because you take this demand from these big fleets and you use that to scale. So every time you want to go into a new market, you already have business waiting for you. So. In this distributorship model that uh, Dr. Abishan, the, the, the acquirer, um, in this model that he's going after, he's essentially going to provide all the tools for someone to start fuel delivery. Right now, there's like 30 or 40 startups that are doing fuel delivery. And when we started, there was four. It was, it was me and, and three other guys. That's the three, three other guys. And now there's 30 or 40 all over the world in cities everywhere. People think this is really cool. So what Dr. Abishan is doing is creating three more companies. One is going to build the trucks and lease them. Another is going to provide the technology and license it. And the third is going to be the provider of the gasoline. So you don't really know, you don't need to know anything about fuel delivery. You can essentially kind of get your own franchise. It's not going to be called a franchise for legal reasons, but he'll give you all the tools to do so. And he'll take a little piece of your pie along the way from leasing of the trucks from the supplying of the fuel and so on. Um, so that's the model moving forward, to, to do enterprise fueling and then to expand by means of this distributorship model where everybody can sign up and um, bring fuel delivery to their city, wherever it is around the world, here in America or abroad. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for Brandon? Go ahead. Yeah, so um, Baird and I, we met probably about three years ago. 
and we became good friends. And we soon realized that we had complementary skill sets, if you will. He was in between projects, I was in between projects. He had a, a skincare company, uh, which he took public. And he got some money from that. I had some money from my previous businesses, mostly internet marketing stuff. And when we got together, we had this idea, and of course, we butt heads, just like you'd say. And we were 50-50 partners, which is interesting, because there's not one of us that can say, fuck you, I want to do, th do like this. So we would, have to, we would have to ration with each other, reason with each other, um, every decision that we'd want to make uh, that was really important. There were a lot of things that he would leave me to and there were a lot of things that I would leave him to because we had, I'd like to say, pretty well-defined roles. Uh, he was more creative and more operational. Um, I was more tech and sales, executive stuff. So we would be able to make decisions in our own realms without having to get approval from the other partner. But when it came to the big stuff, um, yeah, of course, we'd, we'd have to butt heads. And I'd say that having a 50-50 partnership, I'd rather not have a 50-50 partnership. I'd rather call all the shots. But I think it was good because for the really important decisions that we had to make, we were able to sit down and figure out really what the best course of action was. Uh, if you spend too much time doing that, then it can really slow you down. But I think it was good for us because we could have easily made a lot of mistakes. But it would make us stop and take the time to figure out what is the best course of action. Um, sometimes it, it could be a mistake for you to be a 51% you know, partner, you can call all the shots, and then you know, when someone has a good idea, you shut them down. Thankfully, Barrett was a rational person, and we had a good enough relationship where we could you know, reason our way through both of our arguments. I'd propose you know, the pros and cons of each side of my argument, and he'd do the same. And we were both rational. Okay, you know what, Barrett, you're right, your idea is better. Okay, Brandon, you know what, you're right, your idea is better. So we did butt heads, we did fight sometimes, but at the end of the day, we, we'd come around because we were married. And you have fights, people it's have fights. Yeah. It's a marriage. It's a marriage. And you gotta work it out. We had counseling sometimes. Yeah, but we get in, uh, <laughs> yeah, but we get into With friends, with, uh, friends would come in and help. Yeah, but we get into the co-founder, seriously consider, because it is pretty much getting into a marriage, so. Um, any other questions for her? Yes. Looking forward at your new venture, right? Tell us a little bit about what worries you most and what excites you most about. So if you obviously chose this, you could have done a lot of different things. What's exciting about it? What worries you most? Yeah, so Mexico worries me just because it's Mexico. <laughs> so we're, we're doing telemedicine in, in Mexico. You have 130 million people there on uh, government health care and it takes about a month for someone to get to a doctor. So I'm worried because I don't really know much about Mexico, I'm reliant on my partner for that. Also, I'm uh, worried about my partner because I don't, I don't know him that well. Uh, Barry, I've known for a while. Um, Tony, my partner, I've, I've known for a while, but I, I don't know how well he's gonna be able to execute on what we wanna do. Um, a lot of the assumptions are based off of Tony's ability to be able to get government officials to adopt this or to get other Mexican companies to adopt this. I'm typically the sales guy. And I won't as easily be able to contact these huge companies in Mexico to sign up for this you know, telemedicine platform. I'm reliant on him. So I'm worried about that, but I'm also excited about the opportunity because his company is probably the best company we could possibly work with anywhere in the world. And um, it's, an extremely valuable asset to have this company behind us to, to launch this platform. So, you know, you're concerned about your partner, can he pull through? Um, you're concerned about your market, um, which in our case is, is big healthcare companies, will they adopt, or the government itself, will, will the government adopt? And, um, you know, you have these assumptions, but you gotta, you gotta test, you gotta validate as soon as you can, Build lean. We're not we're not raising any money to do this. We're going to do this with our own money, and we want to do it as cheap as possible. And hopefully, we can you know figure out if this is a good idea or a bad idea before we waste too much time and too much effort, too, too much money. Anyone else? Is anybody starting a company now? Is anybody here from the lab? I hang out here all the time. <laughs> okay. What were you saying? No, I was just answering. Starting a company. 
You're starting a company? I'm working You're working, okay. What is, what is your company? So basically, uh, it's a vending machine on the lift and on the floor. Oh, okay, a vending machine inside uh, the rideshare services. Cool. Does anybody have an idea for a company and has not launched yet? Subscription <laughs> base, you can give us a flavor of the month. Uh, we're thinking more like, of like the beard of shape club, dollar shape club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some wild like commercial. Yeah, we're yeah, we'll looking at some funny advertising. You know, I've never actually finished a chapstick. I buy them, but I've, I've never gotten to the end of one. I don't even know what it looks like down there. Yeah, sure. so, a lot of ways to chaps. Is going to fix that? Yeah, so we actually want to have it fit in your wallet because not only the triple jack and the home wallet keys, yep. and then more things, chapstick, no one ever has that. So if it's in your wallet, you always have it with you. And maybe you can find the bottom of it. Makes your lips kissable. I mean, what's going to be your tagline? <laughs> is there anybody in healthcare that I can talk to? Okay, I appreciate that. Oh, you're an Endeavor company? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so yeah. Yeah. That's where that connection comes from. Anybody else? I just a question. Are you familiar with Gus? No. Gus is G U S D. G U S. Okay. No. No. Tell us what? Why? Well, no, it's a funny way. I'm sorry, I thought it was actually. They started off with, I don't know if you guys are familiar with like, Tax Rapids or Gopher? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so they started off basically doing that same thing over in Mexico. And uh, that was the beginning plan, but then at one point they pivoted. And they became this kind of like connector for businesses that are trying to connect with people, uh, like through FaceTime, to kind of help them out with like, regular questions that they were to have. So they are this company that's starting to grow in Mexico. It's a pretty big team. And they might be able to. So, so they built they built tech basically to have experts on the other end, so you can consult exactly. them on your phone. Exactly. Almost like Clarity. You heard of Clarity? No. Yeah, it's, it's well, you pay uh, to talk to an expert, but at a very high level. Uh, yeah. There's a business model and everything. <laughs> um, anybody else starting something? You have an idea? Think about jumping off the cliff into startup world, and you feel very scared. You need someone to jump with you. No? They need someone, to, perhaps, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, if you're building something, uh, I know people who left their jobs or they're thinking about leaving their jobs. Um, and they kind of want to figure out what's the safest route to do this. And I'm like, dude, girl, just jump. There is no easy way or any other way to tell you how to get your feet wet. You just got to jump in. Um, I think before you jump, there's one book that you have to read aside from Lean Startup, and it's a uh, four-hour work week from Tim Ferriss. If you haven't read it, please fucking read it. <laughs> it's really that guy Kawasaki has a great book too, The Art of the Start. Um, I recommend that one as well. It's a good read. But yeah, you can read all these books, but hey, um, experience. I mean, he said that himself earlier. He learned a lot more just like doing the thing on the web and also, I mean, more than he did when you were in business school, right? Yeah. So, yeah, you just have to get out of there. I'm not saying to be a, a complete idiot and toss yourself if there's fire below uh, the cliff, but um, certainly you're gonna have to get out of there and experiment. And to that, I really wanna say, Miami has grown into a very, very, um, it's a great hub for resources around entrepreneurship. I don't think you can necessarily teach entrepreneurship. You have to, I think you have to experience it. Um, and I know that people who are trying to teach it, you know, the Founders Institute, you know, a lot of mentorship happens through Endeavor. In fact, uh, I think one, uh, Salisbury runs uh, mentor.co, um, uh, you know, where they do mentorship and stuff like that. But you have a lot of meetups. You know, have Refresh Miami, you have uh, events here at the Lab Miami. To subscribe to a lot of their newsletters and see what's coming up, or just go to Eventbrite and say, okay, Tech in Miami, start in Miami, just go to meetup.com, and you'll, I guarantee you, you'll find a group that will be more than willing to, you know, willing to welcome you and give advice. Um, and a lot of people have time, a lot of people have done this before, uh, want to give back. Uh, you'd be amazed. 
space, you know, go to lunch with you, grab coffee, whatever. Uh, so don't be afraid to, to ask a ton of questions. Um, there are a lot of really generous people out there with our time. Anybody else have any questions? If not, um, you might have some time to catch the killers. Um, but it was awesome that you're here tonight. And we thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Thank you.